Your partner said they'd be home by six, but showed up at 8.30 because, you know, they got caught up in something and lost track of the time. Again, your partner zoned out again, yet again, during an important conversation and you're left feeling unloved and unimportant. Or maybe your prom partner promised to figure out vacation plans, but now says you never even had the conversation and they never promised anything. You love someone who is distracted, disorganized, and impulsive. Yep, your partner has attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADD or ADHD, and it's driving you nuts. Well, I'm here to help. Today, you'll learn all about ADHD and my 12 steps to finding connection and peace with your partner. So stay tuned. Welcome back. Hello. So glad you're here at the podcast. This is Relationships Made Easy. I am your loving, loving host, Dr. Abby Metcalf. And yeah, you wrote in. So many of you DM'd, wrote in, emailed, smoke signals. I don't even know, asking this question. And I have to tell you, or asking about this topic. And I have to tell you that I have had multiple, multiple, multiple couples I have worked with and individuals who were with someone. Uh, who had ADHD over the years. So multiple couples were, you know, one of the partners had ADHD and I've never worked with anyone where they both do, I have to say, but, um, and I've certainly worked with many individuals who either have ADHD or had a partner who does. So I feel very, very uh, well-informed on this topic. As always, I will link to the research and there is a great book, I'm forgetting the name right now, I'll remember by the end. Um, about marriage and ADHD, which you've probably already read if you're listening, but uh, my, and my stuff's different as always. I'm always putting my spin on things and what I know from my experience and then coupling that with what's already out there. So let's jump in. Why, why wait a moment to talk about this? So first we just have to talk about what exactly ADD or ADHD is. And, and so actually first things first, ADD and ADHD are the same thing. Same thing, ADD, attention deficit disorder, is, is really an outdated term now. It, we now call it ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Now, someone can have ADHD and not, not have the hyperactivity part, but we still call it ADHD. So it, 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 you know, again, if you have it or don't have it, it's still all called ADHD. Um, that's the diagnosis. And this is a diagnosable condition. I want to be really clear. We use our big uh, diagnostical and diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders, uh, number version five. Yeah, uh, you know, that's what we use to, and that's in that big book. And um, so it's a real thing. It's a real diagnosis. And to be diagnosed, obviously, you know, you shouldn't do on your own. I want to give that caveat before I jump in here anywhere. I hear, I think ADHD to me is like narcissism. People just say it. Oh, he's a narcissist. She has ADHD. They just say it without realizing this is a real diagnosis. You can have narcissistic tendencies. You could, or you might have a drug addiction and be acting like a narcissist, but you don't have narcissism. You have drug addiction. You know, there's, and ADHD is the same. It can look like depression. It can look like drug addiction. It can look like a lot of things. So having a professional diagnose, I, I just, please, I'm begging you. I've talked about this so much on the, on the show. I'm so sick of people Googling WebMD or whatever. I mean, that's fine as a first thing to even think if, is this something I have? But please go see a professional. Go see a psychi a psychiatrist would be the one who would diagnose this generally. Um, but I could, you know, a psychologist can diagnose and certainly a master's level counselor can also diagnose. Um, but you really want someone who, there's no like test exact, there, I mean, there is, but there isn't. You know, usually in an office setting, um, they're not gonna, there's, not, there's like a battery of tests you can take for all kinds of things, but, um, it's, it's a way we ask questions, a way people answer them and kind of a feel, a lot of it, just so you know. So, and again, and doing what we call a differential diagnosis and making sure it's not something else uh, in there. So if you're listening, make sure that has happened. Even if you're sure and you've done all the Google research, you know, don't be so sure your partner has it unless they've actually been diagnosed by a professional. Okay, having said that, it's definitely, ADHD is definitely one of the more common 
mental disorders um, affecting children. And that's, you know, where it has it's diagnosed generally. And then obviously, you know, the, the problem is that those children grow up now have those issues that were learning and school issues first are now career and relationship issues, right? You know, things, things sort of shift. And, but a big issue is that a lot of diagnose, a lot of adults were never diagnosed as kids and don't realize they have adult ADHD and all the problems that go along with it. They're just feeling frustrated and, and crazy and upset. So I've never had a formal diagnosis, which again, it's a good thing to have as an adult. Just wanna throw that out there. Um, so, and let me just say, I'm not gonna get too deep here because I wanna get into our, our tips of what to deal, how to deal, but for someone to be diagnosed with ADHD, they need to have had consistent symptoms for at least six months. And there needs to be, they can't just have had problems at home. Like it has to be in more than one setting. So, you know, if they only have issues with you, but work and their family of origin and friends, everything else is great, then it's likely a different issue, even though, again, the symptoms are similar. And this is the stuff that people, you know, don't really know necessarily. And what we uh, prof health professionals know, and that's the thing I, 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 I really try to impart you know i'm not i'm not trying to be like oh the only the experts know everything but it actually does matter in a lot of things i mean we don't think mds or you know an oncologist is oh he's the only one or she's the only one that knows about you know this kind of cancer well they are an expert in it and they do know a lot of things you don't know and they have been studying it for years and they do have ways of and so for some reason i think we'll trust them but not like a psychologist who says the same thing or, or not think we need that same level of help. And your mental health is, I would argue, more important than your physical health. And I would argue that your mental health impacts your physical health greatly. So, and obviously vice versa, don't come for me. Um, but anyway, there you go. So am I, have I been on my soapbox long enough? I think so, all right. So there are three main types of adhd and i do want to talk about that there's what we call predominantly inattentive that's number one number two is what we call predominantly hyperactive or impulsive that presentation that's how we say it uh, is a presentation and then the third is a combined presentation right so you have some of both so i want to talk first about the person who has an inattentive presentation okay that number one and this person has a lot of trouble staying on task. They have difficulty focusing, staying organized. They, they don't play, pay very close attention to details. They often make a lot of careless mistakes. Uh, you might be speaking to this person and they have you know that look in their eyes that lets you know they're not really listening, that they're kind of somewhere else. That's really common. Uh, they have a hard time following through on instructions or commitments. I, I know, you know, my, my, my son is actually right in the middle. My almost 20 year old son is, is he was, he had testing years ago and it didn't, it said that there was nothing there, but I being the mama bear mother I am, we're having much more extensive testing done now because it really looks like this poor kid has been struggling with ADHD all these years and it was never diagnosed. That's what it looks like. Um, and I feel terrible because I was sure something was wrong. I didn't know it was that. Anyway, I, I really couldn't figure that out. But of course, looking back, it's like, it seems pretty obvious. And you know, we'll, we're getting this professional thing done so that he can maybe have accommodations at school or other places that he might need it. But mostly for himself, not feeling stupid or overwhelmed or whatever those, you know, he's always felt quote unquote bad at school. He's hated it. And now I can understand more why. Um, and you know, it's it's a real, um, yeah, it's really been in the way a lot in ways that we haven't realized and in ways that we've been very frustrated with him. So, uh, <laughs> and when I give him instructions for something, I can never, and I mean never, give him more than one instruction. Like, take out the garbage and the recycling, can't do it, he won't do either. If I say to him, hey Max, can you go take out the gar take down the garbage? He'll go do it. 
he'll he'll yeah mom and he always does it right then like he's actually taught himself not to wait because he'll forget he literally stops whatever he's doing and goes to do it and i've always thought oh that's so nice you know he's so whatever but i realize it's probably been a strategy that he developed on his own like i got i gotta do this stuff or it's never gonna happen um and then when he gets back, I can say, you know, I usually wait a little bit, but I'll say, oh, will you also, you know, bring the recycling, please? And he'll be like, sure. And he'll go grab the recycling. But again, if I give him a list of two or three things, forget it, it's not gonna happen. But one thing can happen. And again, it's usually if it happens in the moment. Uh, and what you'll also find is that this person will likely start something with a lot of energy, but lose their focus pretty quickly. And that couldn't be more my max than it's amazing. Um, <laughs> or you also, it's interesting because you can find that this person can get very deep on something and not lose interest, like on like one thing and actually go down a rabbit hole and be too attentive to it. You know what I mean? Like too into this thing. Um, and that's something a little different, but it's really the other side of this coin. Uh, they for sure, this inattentive presentation doesn't matter. They don't manage their time well. Their desk or their bedside table is often a mess. I'm gonna sneeze. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm not stopping. You know that. Um, <laughs> so they they avoid. Though I, I want to finish on that. Sorry. They'll you know they're. Um, again, I'm thinking of Max a lot. They're constantly like losing things like their keys, their glasses, their phone, their papers. Um, I'll tell you really funny, something really funny when we're, again, we just took Max, like literally we're doing it now. We don't have the results back yet, but we're doing all this testing now. And um, on, the <laughs> on the way to the test, the last day when I had to bring him and it's hours that they have to sit in this stuff. But on the last day he forgot his phone, like just forgot his phone completely. And here I am, I have to drop him off. And how am I gonna know when to pick him up? Cause there wasn't a definite end date time. And you know, it's just a mess, right? And then there's these forms that they ask you that the psychologist who's doing this asks you to take home and like, you know, his dad and I each filled out a form and Max himself filled out a form. And of course, and we got all the forms back in and did all this, you know, he's there for many hours he put in, like taking these tests. And then, and he finished maybe two weeks ago. And yesterday I find his answers to his tests <laughs> in his room. And I was like, Max, weren't you supposed to give this to Stan? Like, you know, the guy's doing it. And he said, oh yeah. He goes, oh my God, I forgot, you know, perfect example. He just never, and when we were leaving that day, I remember I'd said to him, do you have, you know, everybody's, um, you know, me, your dad and your, you know, answer. And I saw them in his hand and he goes, yeah, I got everybody right here. I'm like, great. And I didn't, you know, this is when you learn, I needed to have checked and said, well, read them off. Do you got all three? You know, I, I just was like, sure. He says he does. He does. I can see them. But yeah, he was missing one. It's just a perfect example of the consistent way that things show up. Um, he, Max, just, this happened yesterday. He, he was using the air fryer. You know, we have a lovely air fryer, but it's like a toaster oven combo. And he didn't, he put something real, I don't even know, I think he was cooking a pork chop in there with no, I had taken the screen and everything out to wash it. It was like full of grease and dirt and grossness. And I had relined, I even relined the little, you know, tray with tin foil. I did all the things, but I hadn't put it back together yet. And he cooked, he just didn't, he just cooked without it. So gre it started like a fire. I mean, it was a mess. <laughs> Crease was everywhere, all over the inside. I actually thought it was ruined, but he did manage to clean it. But this is the kind of thing where you're going like, and I will tell you, my son is not an asshole. Like he never wants to displease me or his dad or anyone, like ever. And it was like, he just, I don't know what to say. Like he, he so he's not trying to do it, even though it seems sometimes <laughs> like he is. He's really not trying to piss anybody off, even though he's very good at it. Um, this is just what happens. I don't, I don't know what to say. Uh, but it's a perfect, you know, if you live with someone with ADHD, you're nodding your head right now going, oh my God, I can name 50 things like that. So anyway, and so, and they also generally avoid 
anything that takes sustained mental effort, unless it's something they enjoy immensely, kind of like I was saying before. So this person, they might, you know, they have no ability to stay focused during your couple's therapy session, right? No ability to stay focused there, but then they stay up all night playing video games or, or reading about World War II or, or so, and you're like, what the F, what the F is going on? Uh, their time management sucks. This is all part of the inattentive type. Uh, their time management really sucks, which means they, so they make promises and commitments and they make them in good faith, but don't keep them. They forget to return phone calls, pay bills, uh, pick up the dry cleaning, you know, you, and you'll, you'll say, you'll ask them, you're like, Hey, can you write it down? Can you make a list? But then they forget where they put the list. You know, yeah, you're just, you're, you're homicidal by the end. I know. So the hyperactive or also called impulsive type is the second kind of ADHD. And this type is often, this person is that one who's like buzzing with this like, this kinetic energy. You can feel it, they're always sort of on the go, or you can kind of just feel them vibrating or ready to burst. I don't know what to say. I've had clients with this and you can just feel it when they're in this session. There's just a restlessness to them, a fidgeting. A, and sometimes they're not always like fidgeting so much, but they kind of are. Maybe they're, you know, trying to vape during the session or they're, they're getting up with their phone and walking around, you know, if I'm doing a Zoom session or their computer. Like it's, it's, it, they have a hard time sitting still or they might be very talkative and consistently interrupt or jump into conversations that were none of their business. You might find that. They might even jump, I've seen people jump uninvited into, I was at a party once playing charades and this guy, like we, we were, it was the women playing. Like we had said, like the boys were all doing something, the women, we had kind of pulled ourselves to the side and we wanted to play charades. The men were doing something else. We we're like, cool, we'll just do, we'll do a gender thing and we'll just play. And this guy came in and who I always knew in my heart had ADHD. And he like took over the game from us, like uninvited. We didn't want him there. <laughs> I actually told him to leave and he didn't. Um, and he meant well, he wasn't trying to be an asshole, but you know, you're like, are you kidding me? Uh, this is also the person that will blurt out answers in, in class or in a meeting and they, they'll they dominate, you know, with talking and commenting often in a work meeting uh, or at a party or something. They might finish your sentences or have they just have trouble having a real conversation because they don't really listen when others are talking and they don't allow them to speak much at all because they're dominating the conversation. And they're like, they don't know how to take turns talking. <laughs> it's just them talking at you, you know, it's kind of what happens. And so of course, and again, type number three of ADHD is to a combination. So someone might be a combination of the two, which is really kind of this third type of ADHD. And what I'm talking about, my wonderful son, Max, he does tend to like sometimes talk, like if we're watching a movie or something, he just talks like he does not shut up during, <laughs> during anything we're watching. <laughs> he just talks and talks over the people. I'm like, what are you doing? I'm trying to listen. Um, God bless him. Uh, but he doesn't have this rest. Like he'll, he'll, he likes to go do stuff. He does, but he can sit. He can sit, he can hang out, he can he can do the thing, you know? Um, so he would be more of the inattentive type than the impulsive type um, overall. And some, you know, impulsivity is hard to, you know, with teenagers, God, they're so impulsive, so it's hard to tell, but there you go. So let's talk about what causes ADHD. That's a, a question I've been asked a lot, and we don't know. Uh, I'll tell you that, that's the short answer, we don't know. Scientists have not been able to identify any specific causes of ADHD. And there have been studies for sure showing that genetics definitely contribute to ADHD. And there's even been several genes that have been linked to ADHD, but there's been, you know, no specific uh, combination has been pinpointed in any way as like, this is the cause. There, and again, I'll link to all the research in the show notes on the on my website. So if you want to go look at it, party on. Um, but uh, they they have shown, you know, research does show, like they've seen this in studies that there's an that there are anatomical alt differences in the brains of children and adults who have ADHD in comparison with others who don't have it. So we see that the brain is different. It is func definitely functioning differently for those with ADHD. 
And for sure, there have been a few uh, non-genetic markers that have been linked to ADHD. Um, you know, low birth weight, premature birth, of course, and then uh, alcohol, smoking, exposure to lead, uh, all these during pregnancy, of course. Extreme stress during pregnancy has been linked. So there have been, and again, I'll link to all the research, but so there have been some things, but when it all comes, you know, down the pike, we, we really don't know what causes it. Okay, so let's get into it. So ADHD and relationships. When you love someone with ADHD, what I see is that there's a pattern that tends to develop, okay? So if you're the one who loves someone with ADHD, you're kind of exhausted and drained, emotionally at least, if not physically drained, because you've been holding down the fort, making sure everything's taken care of. You, you try to rely on your partner, but they consistently don't come through. So you feel like you can't, you know, you can't count on them. And like the only, you feel like the only adult in the relationship a lot. You, you remind them, you cajole, you know, to follow through on commitments. But after a while, it's just easier to do it yourself. Because, and because of all this, you feel uh, unappreciated, you feel frustrated, lonely, unimportant, yeah. So that's all happening on your side, right? Yeah, I know. No, I don't have a camera in your home, but the, I know because this is what everybody goes through. So meanwhile, though, I want you to think about your partner, the person with ADHD, they feel micromanaged, criticized, and nagged. And I'm sure they've told you that many times. To their mind, there's nothing they can ever do that's enough. And you know, you're just focusing on the times they don't fall through versus all the things they do get done. They probably complain that you treat them like a child and often maybe they tell you, you know, just to relax, to let things go. Uh, they think you're too anal or too uptight about things. They see you as controlling and nitpicky. And the, uh, what I see is they'll often say something just so you'll get off their back and they have no intention of doing the thing they, <laughs> they do, which kind of reinforces them acting like your kid and you being an adult. But, um, and, that has definitely happened with Max, where he has just lied right to my face. He's just stared at me and lied and said something because he couldn't handle my asking about it anymore. <laughs> and so he just said, yes, of course that's happened, and it had not. Um, and, you know, what I hear a lot when I have couples, you know, and I'm working with this, they the person with ADHD almost always says they changed, she changed, he changed, whoever the person, the other, per, their partner is, they're, my partner changed, you know, in the beginning of the relationship and, and, and you have, and I'll tell you why, because in the beginning of the relationship, your partner's ADHD symptoms were likely manageable, especially when you lived apart, you didn't see them constantly looking for their keys and you weren't living with that messy desk or refrigerator that hadn't been cleaned out in months. So, you know, there's this distance. You might've even thought some of that was cute. Oh, it's so cute. They can never find their keys. It's, I know it's not cute now, right? You're, you're covering your mouth right now. Going, oh my God, I did that. Yeah, I know, I see you. But then you move in together and the stakes get higher. Right now the stakes are getting higher. You're, you know, but again, your partner has a job, they're making their life work. So you dismiss a lot of the things that, you know, these kind of red flags, or you're okay for the first year or so picking up the slack. You're, you're kind of like, oh, I, you know, I'm of service. I love them. I'm happy to help, right? Because again, stakes are lower. But then life gets more serious. Maybe you buy a house. Maybe you get married. Maybe you have some kids. Maybe you move, change jobs. Life becomes more stressful and full. And now those ADHD symptoms either get worse or just seem to get a lot worse. So you do change your expectations because now there's more to do and you need them to step up. And I'm not saying you're wrong in that. I'm saying uh, you, you, you're... This isn't, this isn't what you, you know, you're married. This isn't what you got with. You, you know, you hate 
and you hate being a nag. You, I talk to you all the time. You hate it. You hate it. You don't want to feel this way. It just feels, it feels so unfair. Are you supposed to just, you know, be a martyr and do everything and, and make all the appointments and clean up your partner's messes? Like, is that what you're supposed to do? And so in the end, and no, you're not. But in the end, everyone, everyone's feelings are hurt. Your partner's feelings, your feelings, everyone's resentful. Everyone feels misunderstood and unloved, unseen, unheard. So you end up with two really hurt people who don't feel accepted or seen. And that is, you know, ugh, that is relationship kryptonite. That's some, some bad shit going on that we need to change, right? So let's do it. Let's change it. So here, I'm gonna have a sip of water, hold on. <clears throat> so here are my, <laughs> you don't realize, you know, I talk for like an hour straight, it's not easy. I know, cause I love to talk. So it seems like it would be easy for me, doesn't it? But it's, it takes a minute and I have to remember my points and all the things I wanna say and stay really focused. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so sometimes my voice gets a little hoarse, okay. And if you're watching me on YouTube, hello, I'm, I'm, you can't see how cute my shirt is. Oh, well, it's all right. It's all right. It's all right if you can't see all the fun fashion. Uh, if you are watching me on YouTube, please subscribe and like and maybe leave a little comment. You can tell me how much you like my shirt or uh, how much you like, you know, this topic or any suggestions you have for other people. I've been really up in it lately. Um, I'm actually going to start doing some YouTube lives soon. I know. I'm not going to really formally announce it until I'm really doing them. Um, but I'm gonna take kind of that Ask Dr. Abby stuff and do it YouTube Live way. So if you send in a question, I'll answer it on YouTube Live is what I'm gonna start doing because I just get a lot. I, I get enough where I can have like a topic like this that I think can really help a lot of people, but then there's some more specific things that I'd like to help people with. Um, and I'll do some Ask Dr. Abby's, but anyway. And if you're not on YouTube, if you're somewhere else, if you could please leave a review on Apple uh, Podcasts or rate me on Spotify, rate the, and, and definitely always follow and subscribe on those platforms. Cause again, it just helps us get seen and heard. Um, and we have well over a million downloads now, you know, we're in 178 countries now. I'm trying to remember how many countries we have. It's huge. So thank you for being here with me. I know it's so fun. Okay. You're like, shut up, Abby, and get to the 12 steps. You're right there. All right. And you know I'm in recovery, so the 12 steps felt good. You know, I was like, oh, can I come up with 12? I ease I had 15, actually. I had to make them down into 12. All right. So here's <laughs> having having enough is never my issue. <laughs> it's always having too much to talk to you about. So here are the 12 steps to a happier relationship if you love someone with ADHD. Okay. Number one, and we're gonna, you know, book through these. You're not gonna be here another two hours. All right. Number one is don't take things personally. It is, you have to stop assigning meaning to what your partner does or doesn't do. If your partner zones out during an intimate conversation, it doesn't mean they don't love you. I swear, it means they have fucking ADHD. That's all it means. Get their attention, if you notice it, because you do, you see the little eyes get distracted, and ask lovingly, like notice it, and go, hey, <laughs> hello. You know, ask if you can continue with the conversation or if you should come back to it later. Ask when they zoned out. You know, hey, what was the last thing you heard me say? <laughs> ask them to repeat back what you said to be sure they're in the conversation with you. Do this from a loving, accepting place, not from fear and anger. Do not feel rejected or abandoned by this. You can't, you can't, you have to stop with giving it all this meaning. Your partner loves you, they're a good person, they are struggling and you're struggling and that's what's happening, okay? It doesn't mean you should just not have the conversations or not be able to talk to them. It means you have to understand what's going on and not get your feelings hurt. You can't get butt hurt by this. And number two, my second step will help you with this, and that's to separate your partner from their symptoms. Okay, this is big, I think. When, when someone has an addiction, okay, so if, if someone comes to me who has a drug and alcohol addiction, I talk a lot with their family members, I talk with them too, about separating out character traits from symptoms of their disease. You know, if you have the flu, 
and you get a fever and, uh, you know, I don't know, a cough or something, those are, right, those are symptoms of the flu. And when the flu is handled, when it's under control, when it's gone or whatever, the symptoms go away, right? The symptoms lessen or go away. That is what happens with addiction too. When you have addiction, it, the symptoms are things, the difference is that with the flu, it's something often biological. Although you get irritable too when you have the flu and other things, but um, you might forget things, get a little brain fog. But a lot of the symptoms are very biological, right? Coughing, sneezing, whatever, fever. But with things, mental health disorders, like addiction or like ADHD, the symptoms are different. So with, with drug and alcohol addiction, for example, um, and we say substance use disorder now, um, not addiction, but bear with me. Uh, <laughs> the symptoms of the disease are things like lying, being self-centered, being irresponsible. You know, those kinds of things are symptoms of the disease. They're not personality traits. It can seem like an addict is lazy, right? You might even call them that. You're lazy, you're irresponsible, you're this, you're that. But once a person is truly clean and sober, the symptoms are alleviated and they act very differently. That's actually how you know if someone really is clean and sober and not just not drinking or not doing drugs, their behavior changes. So the way I was when I was using heroin, um, when I was an active addict, you know, I lied all the time. I did, I did terrible, terrible things. I did, I did terrible things that I, I try not to feel still ashamed of, but really hurt to think about still, just how, Ugh, hijack my brain was. Um, I don't do those things now. I'm not saying I've never told a lie in 30 years, <laughs> but not like that and not like to hurt people and not, you know, in such a selfish, horrible way. You know, if my sister asks, asks me if I liked her haircut, I might lie and say yes, even if I didn't, just because I don't see a reason to say no, you know, something like that, you know, but I'm not like lying, lying like I used to. That was a symptom of my disease. It wasn't, a, I wasn't a liar. I was lying a lot due to my disease. Does that make sense? I hope it does. So the same can be said for how you view your partner who has ADHD. You don't label them. I hear people, you know, my partner is so irresponsible. They're so selfish. They're so uncaring and they're not, they're not. These are symptoms of their ADHD. They're a caring, loving person in there. You know that, or you wouldn't be with them. You <laughs> Don't you remember the person before all the stakes were high when you were first dating, the person you fell in love with? Yeah, that they're still in there. So don't, when the ADHD, the, the difference is that with something like drugs and alcohol, you can just really stop using drugs and alcohol and work a program. Um, oh, I guess it's not different because if you just stop, okay, let me, let me back that up. With drugs and alcohol, if you stop using them, but you don't work a program, you don't go to therapy, you, you just stop using, you'll still be probably a liar and an asshole and you know act like that, I should say. And you'll still have all those symptoms because you're not really taking care of the, the whole thing here, the whole megilla. We call that a dry drunk when someone, is, they're dry, they're dry, not sober, you know, they're, 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 they're dry. And that can be with ADHD too, right? You could, you know, it, it's, you have to look at that, that if they're really getting treatment and really taking care of, you know, what they need to take care of, they can act very differently. They can show up differently. They can talk about their symptoms differently. They can do all that in a way. And I've just, I've had so many, just thousands at this point of couples who I've worked with or individuals I've worked with with ADHD who feel very different in their relationships. It's not like everything's perfect. I don't think anything ever gets perfect with ADHD. It's not like the person doesn't forget anymore or, you know, won't, you know, get lost in a project or, you know, forget the time, but it's less and it's different how they interact about it. They're not as defensive and they are looking to problem solve. They take responsibility. You know, these are the things that start to change and change the behavior and change your relationship. So, okay, hopefully that all made sense. I. I feel like I went too long, but okay. Number three, step three is to, and these aren't really in order, just wanna say, so there you go. But the third thing is to, you gotta break the parent-child dynamic. You know, what do I always say? You have to connect to correct. And if the connection isn't on equal footing, you're not gonna be able to motivate your partner or yourself, by the way, to be healthier with this, to, to wanna work on it, to get better. If you want a partnership, 
you know, with your partner. You need to treat your mate like a partner, not a child. If you're treating them like a child and expecting them to act like a partner, ain't going to happen. I know. Let that sink in. So, and if they see you as a parent, they're going to act like a annoyed teenager with you who just wants you to get off their back. They're going to do what Max does sometimes. <laughs> this dynamic, to me, is the major breeding ground for the resentment, which is really the killer. The resentment is, when you have enough of that, it's hard to come back from. And of course, a sucky sex life. Nobody wants to have sex with their mother or their or their son or daughter. Like, that's gross. No, no one's like, like, that's why. If you feel like your spouse's parent, you, you're not going to have sex with them. And if they see you as some bitchy nag or, you know, you know, or, or mean nag, you might be a man, you know, the wife with ADHD or partner, a female partner with ADHD, you, they're, they're, they're not going to have sex with you. It's, they're, they're, they want to get away from you. So you really have to break that cycle and understand it for what it is. Number four, and these will all help you. All these steps will help you. And they're all sort of intertwined as you do them. You know, this, like number four is going to help you with number three and number two. You know, like it works that way. Number four is you got to get educated. If you're, and I use cancer a lot because that seems to wake people the fuck up about stuff. But if your partner had cancer, you'd learn everything you could about their type of cancer. You'd consult multiple doctors if, if treatment wasn't working, and you'd likely even join a support group. With ADHD, I often see partners who don't educate themselves past, you know, some cursory understanding. Because on some deep level, they think their partner could control this if they wanted to. That's what you think somewhere deep. You think if they really wanted to change this, they would. If they love me, they wouldn't do it this way. They know what to do and they don't do it. So that means they don't love me or they don't care or I'm not appreciated. I know. I see you. That's part of your problem. It is so in your like fabric of your relationship that you don't even know it's there. You're a fish who doesn't know it's wet and you've got to get out of that. If your partner has cancer, you don't think, oh, they're causing this, even if they smoked. Even if they smoked, at this point, you'd be like, well, I know they smoked and that really pisses me off, but we have to deal with this cancer. It, it's really time to learn more about ADHD and what that what your person is going through. Not just the symptoms, not just, oh yeah, that, that, and that, but really understanding what they're going through. Learning how the brain of a person with ADHD is actually wired differently. And this will help you find that compassion and that ability to distance your partner from their symptoms. That's how that works. It'll also, you know, which is really important, help you keep hope alive, you know, for treatment options and things like that. So, and again, even if your partner doesn't want you, like let's, you might be sitting there right now going, oh, I'm very educated on this, but they won't listen. You know, they won't let me in. I don't care. I don't care. I say with love. I don't care. If again, your partner had cancer and they said, oh, I don't want you involved. You wouldn't go, oh, all right. You'd be like, too bad. <laughs> this affects both of us. And you'd find a loving way to make that right clear. And so number five is you got to work on empathy. If your partner has ADHD, they often, again, remember how they feel. They feel different, lonely, overwhelmed. They do. They've got this thing they wish they didn't have. And this thing, that the ADHD itself, makes it difficult to access the help they need to reduce the ADHD symptoms to make everyone's life better. It's sort of like someone depressed, you know, needs to get to a doctor and they can't get out of bed. And yeah, getting to the doctor would make the depression better, but they can't get to the treatment. It's very much, it's very similar to what happens with ADHD. They'll even go to the appointment, but then they'll forget what they're supposed to do, or they'll forget to follow up, or they won't go pick up their meds, or they forget to take their meds, or, you know, I, I've seen it all. I've seen it all. It, it's a struggle. Uh, and they're often ashamed that they can't seem to do what others do with ease. And they probably feel, not probably, a lot of times they feel, because I know they tell me, unworthy of your love. They don't, they feel like they're broken, like something's wrong with them, that they really should be able to fix this easier. They have their own self-flagellation they're going through. And again, all that fear never improved a relationship. And that's what starts to happen. Everything starts to break down. And you know, I did a whole episode on empathy, a very good one, might I add. So go listen. Um, I'll, I, as always, I'll link to it in the show notes, but you could put empathy, Abby Metcalf, into the search engine of whatever platform you're listening to this on, and it'll come up and you can listen there. Number six. Number six, 
I kind of alluded to earlier, you need to get professional help. Like any other physical or mental disorder, professionals should be involved in treatment. I already was on the soapbox. I'm just going to say this quickly. Um, they should help you with identifying helpful strategies. They should help you with treatment. This it, diagnosis, it shouldn't be taken lightly. It shouldn't be dismissed. Um, I'm sure we'll link on the show notes page to agencies that could help you um, find resources for ADHD in your area. But for sure, if you call your treatment care provider, whoever that, your health insurance provider, they should be able to help uh, hook you up with a professional, without a doubt. Number seven is to create more resources. That's step seven. So again, along with getting professional help, which of course is an additional resource, uh, think of how to add other resources from outside the couple to help with this workload inside the home. So again, cleaning people, so, you know, maybe have your cleaning people start doing your laundry, someone to help mow your lawn, someone to drive your kids to school two days a week. You and your partner are a shared battery. My, if you haven't listened to my TED Talk yet, go listen to my TED Talk. I'll link to it in the show notes, but Abby Metcalf, TED Talk on YouTube, you will find it. You should listen, you should like it and, and leave a little comment. Um, <laughs> hit the like button. But you should listen to my TED Talk where I go a little deeper on the shared battery thing, but you're a shared battery with your partner and draining you, if you're doing all the things, the thousands of things that have to get done because your partner's not, that's draining the two of you. So you, the shared battery that is the two of you, you want to have less on the plate. So the ADHD becomes more manageable and you're not left holding the friggin' bag all the time. That's what you want to do. So you want to take things off the plate that don't have to happen. You want to get rid of things that you don't need to happen. Um, and you want to add things, you know, resources from outside the couple to help get the shit done that has to get done. And when I say getting rid of things, you know, maybe your kid just can't be into sports. Again, if your partner had some other chronic illness, like chronic heart failure or something, I'm, I'm going with something terrible, okay? They wouldn't be able to like show up at all the sports things and drive the kids everywhere. Maybe they'd still be able to work and do other things, but they'd have to limit greatly what they took part in in the household. And you would have to figure that out as a chronic issue. How do we address this? So think of that the same way. Sometimes you just, you know, your family and what's around, you just can't do all the things you think are the best or what should happen or anything else. Your kid will be fine in one sport. They're not going to die if they don't also have tennis and also play the clarinet and also go to, you know, drama camp and all like they'll be okay. Matter of fact, they'll probably be happier not having 50,000 things they have to do. But you, what, you know, cause you know what kids really like? A very happy home life. Do you know, do you know what the thing is always on the other side that shows good mental health and a happy kid who does well in life and succeeds? A happy home life. And if you and your partner are fighting all the time, if you're drained all the time, if you're bitching and moaning about your, their, their dad or mom, if, if the two of you, if you and your partner have so much tension that the kids pick up on that, guess what? That you're not helping anybody. So you got to get kind of past these things you think have to happen or should happen. It, it, this is a chronic issue, this ADHD that should be thought of in the family plan and your resources. Again, if, if you know, your partner had cancer or something else, there's certain things you wouldn't do and you would get outside help to make other things happen. So it is time to make those choices. And that brings me actually to step eight, which is to remember that this is a lifelong chronic issue. I, and that's kind of the biggest thing I see is that partners think this is a problem that can be solved and then you move on. Oh, we get some tools, we get the right thing and then it's all done and we move on. No, that is never going to happen. Read my lips or hear my voice or repeat after me. It's not going to happen. Yes, you can find better strategies that work. Yes, you can have less issues, but you're not going to solve this. So it's time to find other solutions like, again, creating more resources, you know, bringing other things in, taking things off the plate that don't rely on the only solution being your partner changing and, you know, acting right. That is, Nope. Again, things might get much better, but this stuff is going to come up again. It's gonna. It's something you have to deal with. It's something you have to be aware of. It's something that's going to be around. It's never just, it's something they're always thinking about. Trust me. Even if they take medication, even if they go to therapy for it, they are working on it all the time. I know. 
They are. And I want you to kind of get that. But you in your head, again, this is so in the fabric. It is so unconscious. It is so the fish not knowing it's wet. You don't realize that you've been hanging your hopes on solving this, that we're going to get to an end point where we find the answers that work and we're just going to have this equilibrium and it's going to be great. Yes, it'll get better. Yes, yes, yes. But it won't go away. So you can't think, oh, we'll just put things together for a little while until we get things stable, and then we'll put, we'll have them all go away. That's going to destabilize. That's going to create a problem. So do you see where I'm going here? That's the thing you have to get. And this is true if your partner has borderline or bipolar or anything else. It's managed. It's not cured. Okay, I know, I know. But when you shift your mindset, you it really opens things up. It really get makes things better, and you can take that breath. I know, believe it or not, thinking of it as chronic and ongoing helps you get over this, you know, crazy like, oh, we have to find the answer. Um, and that brings me to step nine. It's a we thing. Treat the ADHD as a we issue, not a them issue. Even if your partner says it's their problem and they need to handle it. <laughs> Just don't allow that to be their story. Don't allow it to be your story. Their ADHD absolutely affects you. And just as if they had, again, cancer, you wouldn't say, sure, it's none of my business you have cancer. Yeah, go handle it. Let me know if I can help at some point. No. <laughs> the the shame of your partner, because that's what it is, by the way. It's their shame. It's their denial. It's, it's bad things. It's fear. It's fear, fear, fear. It's the only reason they wouldn't let you into this. Fear that you're going to take it over, feel they're going to feel like a child, fear that they're not going to be able to do it. The, the shame of your partner can't get in the way of the ultimate uh, vulnerability that's needed to connect and move forward together. So you, you got to have to, again, from love, not from, not from being a parent and telling them what to do, but from support and love. And that brings me to step 10, which is stop making suggestions. <laughs> stop. Stop it. Stop it. Stop. I'm saying this as loving as I can because every single partner I have who has a partner with ADHD tends to make a lot of suggestions. Sometimes they're in the form of a question. Have you thought of this? Um, oh, what if we tried that? Or what if I go, no, stop it. <laughs> Just stop it. It's not, if it worked, it would have already worked and you wouldn't be listening, okay? So there it is right there. That, that's proof enough right there. Stop making suggestions of what your partner could or should do to better manage their time or their ADHD or whatever. Again, you're not their parent and it's not helpful. If it was, you wouldn't need to keep offering these suggestions. So remember, what do I always say? Don't sack your relationship, S-A-C. Don't offer suggestions, say it after me. Don't offer suggestions, give advice or criticize. Very, very good. Don't sack. So instead of suggesting, you're going to ask those collaborative questions. You can down, I'll have them ready on the website. You can download a copy of all my collaborative questions to ask instead to find out how to best support and help your partner. Okay. And yourself in this because it's affecting you too. So it's a we thing. Again, you notice how these all kind of morph together, which was my intention. All right. Number 11, we're almost there. Number 11 is huge, and that's to have a couple's business meeting once a week. And I will tell you that that is the thing that's big and really makes a huge difference. I did an entire episode on that. I'm not going to sit here right now. I, I did the whole thing on just how to, why a couple's business meeting is so important. I will link to it in the show notes as always on, on the blog page. It'll all be there. Again, you could search couples business meeting, Abby Medcalf, and you'll come on my website or I'm on you know a platform and it'll come up. And I really go deep into exactly what should happen. But basically, it is a once a week meeting. You have a Google Doc or something else where everything is written. And that's where you put everything. And so instead of asking your partner all week, oh, could you change the light bulb? Did you, you know, could you pick up the, this? Could you do that? Could you do, oh, we have to plan vacation. Uh, that is the worst thing ever, ever, ever for someone with ADHD to hear or have around them. Instead, you put it on the Google Doc. You meet once a week. You look at the doc. You say who's responsible. You, you know, you have a whole thing there. And then you come back every week. And for me, when something isn't done into you and you need to make up your own rules, but and then you don't remind your partner. You you don't remind them. Like this is their thing, this is what they're supposed to do, and they'll probably wait till the last second to do it, but that's okay. But that's on them. 
And then you have a deadline for when it has to happen by, and at that point, you'll hire someone to do it, or you'll outsource it, or you'll get rid of it. So whatever that thing is, you know, and you have to decide. In my home, it's two, it's two meetings, right? So let's say on the you know, first of the month, we have a meeting, the second week, if it's not done, it gets put back on, and and it's a, you know supportive questions are asked like, hey, is there something that happened that you know got in the way of you doing this or blah blah blah, and then I hear whatever the answer is, and then so we try to problem solve it together, not like you didn't do your thing and you need to do it again. You know, it's more of a problem solving, and sometimes even right there it comes off their list and they realize that they were you know biting off more than they could chew. Or you create a new due date. It's like, you know what? I don't know why I thought I could do this before this big project is due. Uh, let's do it the week after. And then you can, again, f you know, follow that in the Google Doc. But in general, if it's not done, right? And then you come back that third week. Now I'm back the third week and I ask again, it's still not done. At that point in my family, we assign it out. We don't, I, it's not like, oh, well then, then you're gonna get punished and you're not gonna do it. You know, it's just assigned out. We, in other words, I hire, usually I hire, I hire a guy or a gal to come do the work or whatever it is, you know, and that's it. It's just done. Or it gets taken off the list. We're not gonna, maybe we're not gonna go on vacation or, hey, let's hire a travel agent instead. I know you didn't want to spend the money or do it that way, but now we're gonna, you know, like, it's just a natural consequence of what happened instead of like a punishment. And it just goes to the next level. That's it, that's what happens. And you create money or resources or whatever you need to make that happen. All right. So, but again, the couples business, I got a ton of ideas, a, a clear way to do it. I highly, highly, highly suggest you do it. The couples I've worked with who have this problem, they sit, they to a person say that that's been the biggest help right there just that the accountability the clarity the support of the treating everything like a we coming at it with togetherness um it really helps everyone feel less stress and more productive and things actually get done okay and then number 12 is to stop trying to control your partner you cannot control this per i'm sorry i know you know i love to control people you know it's my favorite thing i'm trying to control you right now but you you just can't you can't control your partner but what you can control is you know my answer your own actions and reactions so you really need to work on yourself and your own emotional management first and foremost you are not a victim in this partnership Take responsibility for using this, these steps to move forward as a team. So, so, so important. Um, and uh, I just remembering the book, let's see, I remembered. Mel Melissa Orlov, I'll link to it in the show notes, but she has a book on ADHD and the effect on marriage or something it's called. And it's very good. I read it a while ago, but it's, it's a really good book. So that's another resource you might try and look at and, and glean things from. I am going to do another um, episode on how to, how, for the person with ADHD, about how to manage their ADHD next week um, or next episode on how to manage ADHD at work. And I, I go deep on this because I've, I've done trainings at uh, corporate trainings on with employees who have ADHD and helping them get more effective at work. So I know what works, I know what helps. So I'll be doing that in, a, in its own episode. That is it for today. Thank you as always, always. Let's all take a breath together. That was a lot. You've got a lot to think about. I love you so much. You can do this. This is important work for you and your partner. Remember that life is happening for you, not to you. So what is this here for? What, you know, what is here for you to get more vulnerable, to get more real, to get more connected? Um, I, I have faith in that. I, I really do. I know that that's the truth of this and I want to support you in finding that because that's where your happiness and peace are and you richly, richly deserve that. So I'm sending so much love this week, uh, a big hug, and I'll talk to you real soon.